The Churches of Christ present Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Shaw Hay Jurgen. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of Let the Bible Speak. My name is Shaw Hay Jurgen. On behalf of this program, I welcome you this morning. For those of you who may not be familiar with this broadcast, Let the Bible Speak stands for exactly what our name describes. We endeavor to look through the pages of God's holy book for truth and guidance. In a world that's filled with questions, we recognize that God provides answers and insights. We're continuing on in our sermon series entitled, What is Christianity? And our study as of late has focused on the life and work of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to read a passage with you from the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, where the Bible says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Today, we'll be looking at the temptation of Christ in a sermon called, Alone in the Wilderness. But before we study any further, we want to take a break at this time for a song. The event that marked the beginning of Christ's ministry was his baptism. There, John the baptizer immersed Jesus in water to fulfill all righteousness and to introduce Jesus as the coming Messiah to Israel. At that occasion, you remember that the Spirit of God descended like a dove upon Jesus, and a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. With those words fresh in his mind, Jesus journeyed empty-handed into the unforgiving wilderness surrounding the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on earth, 1,200 feet below sea level. It's hot, dry, and void of life. It's a region without fresh water and life-giving plants. The monotony of this barren desert is broken only by rocky hills and dark caves. It's a world fit only for wild animals that prowl every night looking for food. It's unbelievably hot in the daytime and unbearably cold at night. It's a place of incredible loneliness. So off he goes, the Son of God, who is so pleasing to his Father, off to a six-week 
crash course in human suffering, off into a world where he has no support, no disciples, no food, nothing but the memory of the will of his Father. One of the greatest truths of life is that after a moment of great triumph, there comes a moment of reaction, a moment of great testing. After Elijah's great victory over the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, he immediately went into a period of depression and doubt. Satan consistently picks such times following spiritual highs to test God's people. Jesus' baptism was a spiritual high for him. God spoke audibly for one of only three times in Jesus' earthly life. He spoke words of blessing to his beloved son. The Holy Spirit came. The 30-year wait was over at long last. His ministry was to begin, but first comes the wilderness. Let's read the account now in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall serve, you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. In the wilderness, Satan attacked Jesus full force. Let's look now for a few moments at these three temptations, which we'll break down into our three points. First of all, Satan tempted Jesus with pleasure. The Apostle John famously categorized temptations by saying in 1 John 2 and verse 16, For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the lust of the flesh is where the devil started with Jesus. Jesus, as we've said, had been fasting for 40 days. It's quite possible that Matthew records one of the greatest understatements of the Bible when he wrote in Matthew 4, 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Yes, I'd imagine he was hungry. And when Satan approaches, he basically says, Are you hungry, Jesus? Work a miracle, son of God, on this rock. Now, why would it have been wrong for Jesus to comply with Satan's temptation here? Jesus would later turn water into wine. He would use just a few loaves and fishes to feed thousands. Why couldn't he turn a stone into bread and eat? Well, Jesus gives the answer when he says in Matthew 4 and verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, this was a time of fasting, not a time of eating. Were Jesus to give in to his fleshly desires to eat, he would have violated his fast and allowed his physical urges to control him. Jesus makes this point by saying, it's not just about food, but this is a time for the Word of God, a time to focus on what the Father's will is. Of course, there's a whole sermon in the words, it is written. The importance of knowing Scripture screams forth in this account. Were Jesus unprepared to face the devil with the Word of God, the outcome of this great temptation could have been very different. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16, How can a young man cleanse his way? 
by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The word not only warns us of Satan's methods, according to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, but it also empowers us against his attacks. Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, verses 6, 16 and 17, above all, taking the shield of faith with which, you will, uh, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And on this occasion, Jesus was prepared to refute the devil's challenge of indulging in the lust of the flesh and in partaking of the temptation of pleasure. But secondly, not only did Satan tempt Jesus with pleasure, but he also tempted him with pageantry. Look again at Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan has now moved on past the lust of the flesh and is working on Jesus by presenting to him the lust of the eyes. Now what was Satan offering Jesus here? He was offering to make Jesus a spectacle. Could you imagine the attention Jesus would receive if he did this, throwing himself from the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, half the city would probably see it. And they would be amazed at how Jesus wouldn't be injured or wouldn't perish. All eyes and all attention would be fixed on him. He'd be the headline of the Jerusalem Tribune for weeks. And certainly Jesus wanted attention, didn't he? He came to earth that he might preach according to his own words in Mark 1, verse 38. But he said to them, Let us go into the next town, that I may preach uh, there also, because for this purpose I've come forth. And his preaching was focused on seeking and saving the lost, according to Luke 19, and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. What a great way to launch his preaching career. Perform this great show... And certainly the masses will come flocking to you, Jesus, ready to hear whatever you have to say. You know, it's hard to move to a place and just start preaching. When I moved to Columbia, I didn't know anyone in the community. I didn't have any rapport built up with anyone. I had to start really from scratch. And Satan here is saying, Jesus, you're from that little podunk town of Nazareth. Nobody in the big city of Jerusalem knows who you are. You don't have any leads generated there. You do this, just do this, to get people in the door, and you'll be off to a great start. And this time, not only is Satan offering him a career starter, but he's using Scripture to do it. He's quoting from Psalm 91, verses 9 through 12. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now let me note something here. Satan did not misuse or misapply scripture on this occasion. The psalmist is discussing the protection that God provides to the faithful. Jesus did not rebuke or correct Satan's use of the psalm. However, to indulge in this temptation would have been sinful for Jesus. Why? First of all, it was not the right way for Jesus to garner attention. 
When we look at Christ's life, from the striking humility of his birth, to the lowliness of his poverty and homelessness, to the unjust treatment he suffered toward the end of his life, we see a man who came to shine the light of God on men, not to make himself a spectacle. Now, Christ did perform miracles, and those miracles earned him attention. But going through with this miracle would not have been about confirming his message. It would, about, it would have been a, a, about getting pageant-like attention, and that would not have been keeping with his character. Also, Jesus gives us a reason for why he couldn't comply with the devil's request when he says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. A quote from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, verses 16 through 19, where the Bible says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land uh, of which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. Here, a caution is given against disobedience to God. Now, how does this fit back with Matthew 4? Well, think about it this way. To expose myself to any danger naturally destructive with the vain presumption that God will protect me and defend me from the ruinous consequences of my imprudent conduct is to tempt God. And Jesus said he could not, he would not do that. Very interesting, though, how in this temptation Satan appears as an angel of light, quoting the word of God, pretending to be interested in a shortcut victory for Christ. This was a dramatic change from the subtle insinuation of the first temptation. Lastly now, Satan has tempted Jesus with pleasure, with pageantry, and also with power. Back in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Here it is, the pride of life. Jesus has refused to give in to the lust of the flesh by turning stones into bread and feeding his hunger. And he's refused to give in to the lust of the eyes by making himself a spectacle for the world to gawk at. But now Satan is offering something very different. Now I want you to think about it this way. When Jesus emptied himself in the incarnation, taking on human form that he might come and work the works of the Father in securing salvation and reconciliation on our behalf, he knew that eventually he would return to the glories of heaven. He also knew, based on Old Testament prophecy, that he would be elevated to the position of king of kings and that he would reign over his eternal kingdom. So knowing all of this, why would Satan offer to make him ruler over all the kingdoms of earth? Because Satan was offering all of the glory with none of the guile. He was offering all the power, none of the pain. All of the rank, none of the rejection. All of the stature, none of the suffering. And friends, certainly this was appealing to Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus himself asked for the suffering to be taken away when he prayed with sweat like great drops of blood pouring from his brow, saying in Luke 22 and verse 42, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus wanted to comply with the Father's will more than anything else in this world, yet he still desired to have the great burden of suffering taken away. Satan's price was too high. And Jesus said no to the devil. I will not worship you. My worship, 
My praise, my honor, my service is for God and God alone. And I love the last verse in Matthew 4 and verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Perhaps this event was in the mind of James when he wrote James 4 and verse 17, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When Satan tempted Jesus, he was challenging the kind of Messiah Jesus would be. He offers three tantalizing options. One, a Messiah who focuses only on felt needs, turns stones to bread. Two, a Messiah who entertains, jump from the temple. Three, a Messiah who compromises in worshiping Satan. It should come as no surprise that the followers of Jesus battle the same three temptations in doing kingdom work. Do you go to a church that primarily focuses on felt needs or one that first and foremost addresses people's spiritual needs? Do you go to a church that confuses entertainment with worship or a church that always asks, is God or the worshiper glorified through our worship practices? Do you go to a church that compromises so you can have bigger numbers? Or do you regard faithfulness as more important than warm bodies in the building? This day, Jesus calls you to come through your own wilderness temptation, to let him help you come through victorious and committed to a life of selflessness, a life of bearing your cross, a life worth the living. Let's have another song. Just a slave. If you have any questions or comments about our study, if you'd like to begin a Bible correspondence course, if you desire a written copy of this sermon, or if you have any other spiritual need, please write us at the Rice Road Church of Christ, 4710 Rice Road, Columbia, Missouri, 65202. We'd also like to invite you to come and join us for worship. We meet this morning at 10 o'clock, this afternoon at 2, and at 7.30 each Wednesday evening. You can contact us by phone at 
1-800-242-9975 or visit us at our website, www.riceroadchurch.com, where we're also posting past episodes of this program. If you live in the Jefferson City area, the Capital City Church of Christ invites you to join them for worship today as well. They assemble at 920 Leslie Boulevard in Jefferson City, and they meet at 1030 this morning, 2.30 this afternoon, and 7 o'clock each Wednesday evening. I'd also like to invite you to view a website that I'm involved with, www.christianlandmark.com. Here you'll find a host of articles, audio and video sermons, and other wonderful material to aid you in your continued study of God's Word. I want to thank you as always for your kind listening this morning. You've welcomed us into your home and we've studied God's word together. Always remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 11 verse 28. Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. God bless. To God be the glory.